Since they were introduced back in Final Fantasy III, summons have remained an incredibly popular feature in the series. And it's easy to see why, as there's nothing quite like calling forth a powerful ally to turn the tide of battle. But as the series has evolved, so too have the designs and animations of summoned entities, and by this point, they really know how to make a spectacular entrance. Now over the years, summons have gone by many names. Espers, Eidolons, Aeons and Primals are just a few, and they have been obtained in all sorts of ways. Summons have also come in all shapes and sizes, from cuddly chocobo chicks to hulking legendary beasts inspired by real world mythology, or in very rare cases, in the form of Thomas the Tank Engine's evil twin. But while you'll no doubt be well acquainted with the likes of Shiva, Ifrit and Bahamut, this list will cover some of the lesser known summons from across the Final Fantasy franchise, as well as a few that featured rather strange or obscure designs and inspirations. So, with our usual caveat that we'll only be featuring one summon per game, and with the additional caveat that we won't be including any obscure summons that featured in our previous video, we're going to kick things off with Minimog from Final Fantasy VIII. Final Fantasy VIII is well known for its impressive range of unique and unusual summons. They took the form of Guardian Forces, or GFs, and they played a significant role in the game's narrative while also being used to enhance character stats courtesy of the Junction system. Many of these Guardian Forces were optional, such as Doom Train, who was mentioned in our previous video. But Final Fantasy VIII featured some summonable characters that would elude even the most diehard players. Fans of the PlayStation version might remember a triple triad card called Minimog, which could be won from the boy running around Balam Garden. Though it wasn't known at the time by many people in the Western world, Minimog was actually a non-junctionable summon that could be obtained via the Chocobo World minigame which was playable on the Pocket Station. But despite Chocobo World still being mentioned within international versions of the game, the Pocket Station peripheral was never released outside of Japan meaning that certain summons were effectively locked out in those regions, even though they were still technically obtainable. While other summonable creatures from Chocobo World still made appearances in Final Fantasy VIII, such as Boko being gifted to Squall in the Chocobo Forest, and seeing Mumbas hang out in the Shumi Village, Minimog remained just a face on a playing card. This all changed with the release of the remastered version of Final Fantasy VIII, which featured a brand new way to obtain the Chocobo World exclusive items. After reading five volumes of Pet Pals magazine and learning the ability Angelo Surge, Rinoa's faithful dog could randomly enter the battlefield and dig up some treasure for the party. The list of items Angelo could find now included Mog's amulet, which was required to learn the mini Mog command. Even so, Obtaining the amulet wasn't guaranteed due to the randomised nature of Angelo's search and the very low drop rate of the amulet itself. However, dedicated fans have found optimised ways to have Angelo farm for items, even if it means leaving the console idle for several hours at a time. The longer you leave it, the more chances Angelo has to finally get her paws on Mog's amulet, which rewards the player with the delightful Moogle Dance. It's one of the very few ways for Guardian Forces to recover health, plus it's worth the effort just to see Minimog bust out some epic dance moves. Like Guardian Forces in Final Fantasy VIII, Espers were central to the plot in Final Fantasy VI. As the story goes, the Gastalian Empire had enslaved these mythical beings so as to find ways of extracting and using their power. However, our heroes were able to call upon Espers to join their cause through the power of Magisite. We mentioned Unicorn in our last video, as this was one of the very few instances where it appeared as a summon despite making many other appearances as an enemy, ally or mount. But the Zona Seeker, also known as Zone Seeker, has only ever appeared twice in the franchise, as a Cloudkin enemy in Final Fantasy XIV and as an Esper in Final Fantasy VI. Zona Seeker's summon effect was Magic Shield, which cast Shell on all party members at a cost of 30 MP. The Esper could also teach the Shell, Rasp and Osmo's abilities. It meant the Zona Seeker had fringe utility, 
But what made this all rather intriguing was that the method of acquisition was quite unusual. Zona Seeker's Magicite could only be purchased for 10,000 gil from the auction house in Jidor as a rare item. Some players have grown wise to this and discovered that they could increase the odds of getting the Magicite by observing the movements of an NPC outside the auction house before entering. Obtaining the Golem Magicite would also boost the chances of Zona Seeker appearing. But while this does shed some light on the matter, Zona Seeker's origin, along with how its Magicite came to be in the auction house in the first place, remains a mystery. Final Fantasy Explorers ended up being a fun little action role-playing game due to its focus on cooperative gameplay. The inspiration from Monster Hunter was quite clear, but by fusing in numerous Final Fantasy elements, Explorers ended up being quite unique. And one of the more unique aspects was the ability to capture defeated Eidolons and turn them into Magicite that could then be used in battle. One such Eidolon was the Dryad a powerful nature-themed boss found in Foster Gardens. Named after the tree nymphs of Greek mythology, Dryad was a formidable opponent whose speciality was inflicting status ailments on the party then quickly hitting them with a mighty earthquake when they were still trying to recover. Dryad would also attack using giant vines and by commanding small enemies to do her bidding. Her signature attack was then the very familiar Very Bad Breath. Outside of Explorers, Dryads have also made several appearances as enemy characters such as in Final Fantasy XI, XIV and in Lightning Returns. But while they have always been themed around plants and nature, their design has changed quite drastically between titles. As a summon though, after Explorers, Dryad did return in Final Fantasy Dimensions 2, this time with a far more human-like appearance. But with so many creative takes on the Dryad throughout the series, we're curious to see if they'll appear again and if so, which form they'll take on next. Magic Pots have made numerous appearances across the franchise, but only on very rare occasions have they been made available as a summon. When encountered, these fussy little creatures can cause serious problems for the unprepared, causing massive amounts of damage should the wrong move be made. But if you manage to appease their wishes, you'll find yourself rewarded handsomely, sometimes with a rare item or a hefty sum of gill. In Crisis Core, the magic pot could be recruited to Zack's cause, and once added to the digital mindware system and called upon in battle during Chocobo mode, it would then execute a limit break called Item Mugger, which let Zack score some extra loot. But recruiting the magic pot was not an easy feat. Zack would first need to complete several optional missions in order to unlock the Master Tombray mission, and it was here that the magic pot could also spawn. But in order for the encounter to be successful, Zack would need to go into the mission with the correct materia setup in advance, these being Assault Twister, Fire R, Gravity, and Jump. Upon entering combat, Zack would have to perform each action when prompted while refraining from using all other actions. Once these requests were fulfilled, the conflict would then resolve and the magic pot would be added to the DMW system. Magic Pot also made a recent appearance in Final Fantasy VII Rebirth as its summon materia was given as a bonus to those who pre-ordered the Deluxe Edition. Described in-game as an eldritch jar filled with supportive surprises, Magic Pot boasts a useful range of summon abilities including Phoenix Down, Remedy and Magic Cocktail. In Final Fantasy XIII, Eidolons were few and far between because each one shared a special bond with an individual playable character. According to the game's lore, Eidolons were the stuff of legends, said to reveal themselves only to select Lassie who'd been bound to a focus against their will. Even then, the Lassie would have to prove their strength by battling against the Eidolon that had graced them with their presence. Many of these encounters were quite epic and the final Eidolon encountered within the game was bound to Vanille. It was called Hecatonchier and it was encountered by just Vanille and Fang in Chapter 11. After being subdued, Hecatonchier would be affectionately referred to as Hecaton when summoned by Vanille in battle. It represented the Earth element and was the only Eidolon in game capable of casting Quake. In Gestalt mode, Hecatonchier would then take on the form of a bipedal machine gun turret and Vanille would hop on top for the ride. 
Like many recurring characters in Final Fantasy, Hagatonshia had its origins in Greek mythology, with its name roughly translating to Hundred Hands, hence its multi-limb design. As such, you would expect that Hagatonshia would always be depicted with more than two arms. But this was not the case during its debut as a boss character in Final Fantasy III, or when appearing as a race in Final Fantasy XIV. However, multi-armed iterations of Hecatonshia were included as summonable entities in Final Fantasy Dimensions 2 and Dissidia Duodecim, plus Vanille's version went on to make a brief reappearance in Lightning Returns as one of the protagonist's allies. Revenant Wings was announced as a prominent part of the Ivalice Alliance sub-series, and although it wasn't an official sequel, it featured Varn and Pinello pursuing their careers as Sky Pirates after the events of Final Fantasy XII. While many of the narrative and lore-based elements were retained, what separated Revenant Wings out from the previous game was its genre. Instead of being a typical role-playing game, it was instead developed as a real-time strategy game. But despite this, many of the core gameplay mechanics were carried over, and the practice of summoning espers to assist the party was still in place. While Final Fantasy XII featured a grand total of 13 espers, Revenant Wings boasted over 50 including characters who were rarely ever seen as summonable beings, and some of which were completely unique to this game. In the previous video, we mentioned Rami, as Ramu's little robot buddy, so let's take another look down the rabbit hole at another obscure summon. The White Hare was a rank 1 esper that required one aura site to enlist. It focused on healing, and was one of three holy ranged summons found in Revenant Wings alongside Carbuncle and Ultima. The unique look of White Hair also reflected its abilities, and its role in battle, as the design incorporated colours and patterns that were notably similar to the traditional White Mage robes. While Revenant Wings remains the only title to date to feature the White Hair, we can't help but wonder if it's any relation to the Giza Rabbit found in Final Fantasy XII, which also exhibited healing abilities, or the Vorpal Bunny that many of us hunted down mercilessly within the same game. That then brings us on to our last entry, the Midgard Sorma. Most of us remember this enemy from the original Final Fantasy VII as it made for a powerful piece of interactive storytelling. And this then carried over to the battle scene, as those unfortunate enough to try and walk through the swamp were in for a pretty nasty surprise as they would need to square off against the Midgard Sorma on their own. Outside of this however, the Midgard Sorma has also made two rare appearances as a summon, like the Zona Seeker, it was obtainable as a Magicite in Final Fantasy VI, but perhaps the more obscure iteration is that it was a summon in Tactics. Known as Midgar Swarm in the PlayStation version, Midgard Sorma was a summon spell used by the legendary wizard Elidibus, an optional superboss found in Midlight's Deep. This already made it quite rare, but what made it even rarer was that Elidibus would only summon Midgard Sorma if it lacked the MP to summon Zodiac. This means that a lot of players would never even see it. After Tactics, the Midgard Sorma never reappeared as a summon, but it has featured in a few other games, including appearing as an enemy in Final Fantasy XII and XV, and Final Fantasy XIV where it went by the Father of Dragons and was given an expansive backstory. But with that, they were seven of the most obscure summons you can obtain from across the Final Fantasy franchise. Be sure to let us know in the comments below which of these summons you've managed to obtain, as well as which you feel are even more obscure or weird, and of course, if you enjoyed the video, please hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. Alright everyone, with that, this is Daryl signing out. As always, I'd like to give a big thank you to all of our Patreon and YouTube membership supporters, especially Benjamin Snow, The Livestream, Gregory, Justin Dent, and Sukun TDK, who are super special Onion Knight supporters, and of course, a big thank you to everyone for watching this video. I'll see you all again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.